McKenzie Elevator Repair Company was a low-budget operation. As such, the buildings we were sent to were often high-rise apartments in the poorer sections of town. I was heading out to one such place with my new trainee in tow. He was fresh out of school, eager to impress. A bright young kid named Tommy. Tall, with short buzzed hair, always quick to smile, constantly joking around, but able to take things seriously when he had to. I was just beginning to like him. We got to the building and climbed out of our white service van with our duffel bag full of diagnostic gear. Only a week before we had visited this place to repair the same broken elevator. It was always on the fritz. At least they had a backup though, so we wouldn't have to climb the stairs. That was one of the worst parts of the job. Some buildings had 30 flights of stairs and only one working elevator. Or both would go out on the same day. Those were not fun jobs to go to, since it would often mean climbing up and down the steps multiple times to reach the problem, and to fetch the necessary parts and tools. The superintendent met us in the lobby. Immediately, I couldn't help but notice a fat cockroach scurrying up the wall of the foyer the place smelled like wet farts and flood damage that had never been repaired. There were yellow water stains on the ceiling and puddles on the aged vermilion carpet that we walked across towards the one working elevator. I don't know what the hell is wrong with this thing, the superintendent said. I knew what was wrong with it. I had told him he needed to replace an expensive part, but he was too cheap to fix it. As a result, people were getting stuck in the thing constantly. That happened to me in the same elevator not long before, and I didn't envy anybody in that situation. We stepped inside the other lift, and I hit the button for the correct floor. I held down the closed doors button and the 28 button at the same time. This would allow us to rise to the top level without having to wait for people to get on and off. A little secret that firemen and repairmen alike know to get where we need to be a little bit quicker. The door closed with a squealing rattle as it closed heavily across the threshold, clanked shut with a loud metallic noise, and we began to rise in the shaking box. It heaved back and forth as we ascended, knocking me off balance and into the wall. The old piece of shit was not improving with age. Is that normal? Tommy asked. No. We got to the top floor and the door opened up. Exiting the elevator, we heard the desperate calls for help from the box next to ours. Help! It's so hot in here, I can't breathe! Please help us! Hey, I'm the elevator repairman, I called down to them. I'm here to help you get you out. Thank God. I heard the muffled sounds of their grateful voices as they spoke to each other. It sounded like there were a few of them. No wonder it was so hot in that tiny box. The thought of all that body heat and packed people in such a crowded space filled me with sudden claustrophobic terror. I had never been scared of confined spaces, until I got stuck in that very same box that those people were trapped in. I remembered back to that day, sitting on the floor of the elevator, cockroaches scurrying around me everywhere in the dim and flickering light, the heat becoming oppressive and overwhelming the longer I waited, the air becoming thick and humid impossible to breathe. I can remember it like it was yesterday. Tommy and I tried to pry open the door and I found it was completely jammed shut. Unusual to say the least, but not unheard of. It would require a trip downstairs to the van for a different tool. I let Tommy know what the plan was and the superintendent, Ronnie, decided to come down as well. So he could let us back in. Down we went in the squealing elevator, rattled and shook violently, descending to the lower levels. We heard a ding, and the door began to slide open, revealing the lobby. I had told Tommy a few rules before we started working together, and as the elevator door slid across its steel track, he unthinkingly broke rule number three. Don't get off the elevator while the door is still opening. He began to exit the door, rattling open, and I began to say something, reaching out to grab his arm, but it was too late. As he went through the threshold, 
The door suddenly slammed shut with tremendous speed and force. I would find out later that the superintendent had put this elevator out of service earlier that day, since it had almost decapitated someone else in a similar fashion. He didn't want to climb the stairs, though, so when the other elevator went out of commission, he just started using this one again. None of this he bothered to mention to us. This elevator was old, the steel door heavy, and when it slid shut, it slammed into Tommy with incredible force. Once it hit him, it did not stop, but continued, crushing him like a sledgehammer through an overripe watermelon. Ever see Gallagher? Yeah, kind of like that. His nose caved in and his jaw shattered as the door crushed him with overwhelming power before I could intervene. He gurgled and spat out teeth as I rushed forward to try to push the door open. His head appeared partially caved in, and I saw shards of his skull protruding from the flesh like broken pottery. I was about to put my fingers in the gap, but then thought better of it. Using my pry bar instead, I tried to wrench it open. I jammed the edge of it into the door frame just above Tommy's head. That was when the elevator began to suddenly decide to go up again, this time much quicker. Tommy was still partially trapped, half in, half out of the door, with the entire thing slammed through the middle of him. The pry bar, and then the top of the elevator door, came down on his head as he rose up to the next floor, caving his skull in from a different direction. That was all his brutalized body could take, and the left side of him collapsed into the lift. The other side was still outside, in the lobby, and we left it behind as we went up. I began to scream with terror at what had just happened, but the superintendent didn't even seem phased. He just looked at me calmly as the box rattled and went up with increasing speed. Shit, he said. That's not good. Hey man, can you keep a secret? I got cash. We can tell people he was screwing around or got caught in the door. Nobody's fault. Or I can tell them you shoved him. It's up to you. He smiled with his greasy grin. A thick gold necklace hung from his sweaty neck, and his bald head gleamed with beads of perspiration as he waited for my response. Before I could say anything, we began to free fall. The box dropped as if the cable had been cut, and I felt my stomach lurch, and the cheeseburger I'd eaten for lunch began to rise up into my throat in sudden protest. If we had been up on the top floor, we would have died for sure, but as it happened, we hadn't gotten up that far yet. Still, the impact was deafening. The force of us stopping suddenly rattled my bones with horrifying pain. Ronnie, the superintendent, had been brought down to the floor with sudden force, and I saw his forehead was bleeding. He was missing a couple teeth as well. We began to send again, and my heart began to hammer even faster in my chest. I wanted to get off this hellish ride. And suddenly it stopped. I heard another ding as the elevator door opened in the lobby, revealing the other half of Tommy as well as a small crowd of disgusted and curious residents. The super got up, scrambled to his feet, and tried to make it out of the box. He didn't quite make it. The door stopped moving and slammed shut once again, landing with sickening force against his bloated midsection. I heard several ribs cracking loudly, and he screamed as it drove itself into him. Blood poured from his mouth, and I raced over to the controls and hit the door open button. Nothing happened. With a large spray of blood like a beach ball sized water balloon exploding, his body was torn completely in half by the door. I hit the button again and it opened. I waited patiently for it to slide all the way across the track and reach the other side. Then, and only then, did I step forward with confidence, leaving the gore filled elevator behind. There was going to be a ton of paperwork after this, I thought. Too bad. I'd like the kid. But you got to remember the rules. Maybe I should move that one to the top of the list.
A lot of people wanted to know some more rules for elevator safety after my last post. Here is one more for you. Rule number one, don't ride the escalator. You say you need an example? An explanation of why not to take these time-saving steel staircases made of gears and chains, pulleys and grease? Just look at all those teeth waiting at the bottom for you. To forget to lift your feet and your flip-flops. Or worse, let's say your hands should somehow slip into the gap. If you should fall down somehow, it happens. Mostly to younger people, but some adults as well. People have had both hands torn clean off. People I know. But the scariest thing about escalators is that they can break. You see them out of service sometimes, and it's an inconvenience, sure. But imagine if they weren't being shut down for proper maintenance. One incident in particular comes to mind that bumped this rule right to the top of the list for me. You see, elevator repair guys don't just fix elevators. We also fix escalators, as you may not have known. And those automatic stair machines are the bane of our existence. We're all terrified of them. We all know someone who's had a hand cut off, a finger pulled out by the damn things. They're that dangerous, but the malls don't want you to know that. Once I was in such a mall, a dirty low-rent affair like all of our clients ascending the escalator, I was fairly new and hadn't yet learned to always take the stairs if you can, and never, ever ride the escalator. Suddenly, without warning, it began to go backwards. Just imagine that feeling for a second. You're about two stories off the ground, mall walkers and wishing fountains full of pennies below, and suddenly you begin to fall sickeningly back downwards and off balance towards the fall floor far below. That's what happens when the main chain snaps. The weight of all those people pull the steel staircase back downwards faster and faster and faster until you're in a free fall. That's what happened to me. I was about to step my foot forward off the top and onto the linoleum floor when I heard the muffled sound of it breaking. I looked back and saw a dozen other people below me, their eyes confused and panicked. My stomach dropped sickeningly as if I were plunging backwards down the first drop of a giant roller coaster. I heard people below me scream as the escalator began to fall back faster and faster, crashing down like a massive steel train pulled from a hillside by an unseen colossus. My body turned in midair, and I realized I was flying without the benefit of low gravity or superman powers. This brought with it the horrible mental image of what was to come. A tangled mass of human forms lay below me as I plummeted towards them. I saw my tools floating around me as I fell, and winced as my flathead screwdriver impaled an elderly woman's eye upon landing. She screamed, and I screamed, and we all screamed for ICU care after I landed on top of her with a tremendous force that caused my jaw to slap shut painfully. When I opened my eyes, I saw a bloodbath all around me. An unfortunate man was howling in pain a few feet away. He had his arm jammed into the teeth at the bottom of the escalator, and several minutes later I witnessed what doctors refer to as degloving when an employee arrived to pull him out. If the word doesn't paint a vivid enough picture, imagine this for a moment. A man with no skin on his hand, flexing and moving his fingers, watching fascinated as he sees his flesh laying on the floor, left behind like a high-quality Halloween mask for his hand. The flesh bunched up and wrinkled, mangled from a hundred sharp steel teeth. Blood everywhere. My head was pounding and I felt heat running down the side of my face as a man in blue 
approached and asked if I was okay. And could I get up? I said I needed a minute, but then I realized it was slightly urgent when I saw the bloodied face beneath my boot. I had ended up on top of several people, including the now-dead octogenarian, which I had unwittingly impaled with my favorite screwdriver. The mall manager walked over to me and stared down at me ruefully. Do you have any idea how much this is going to cost to clean up? I told him I had no idea. He grabbed me by the arm and pulled me up off the other people. At first I mistook his actions for trying to help, but then his security guard goons grabbed me and started to push and shove me towards his office down a long, long hallway. My heart began to pound in my chest. Where the hell were they taking me? I need a hospital. I think I broke my jaw, I told them. But they ignored me. The dingy walls and floors got dirtier and darker with neglect as they pushed me down back halls to an isolated room. They shoved me in there and locked the door, leaving me alone in the cold room. The space was empty save for a single steel folding chair and a light bulb. It looked like an interrogation room at Guantanamo Bay. I could feel my pulse beating quick and heard it drumming in my ears as I tapped my foot in nervous exasperation. The minutes ticked by, turning into hours. My fear began to increase exponentially as I realized they were going to try and somehow cover this up. But how? Hundreds of people had seen it. It was foolish of them to even try. I waited in the room full of anxious fear until someone came in. But it wasn't the manager or, or a security guard. This man was dressed in a expensive looking suit, had green eyes and short slicked hair. He looked like a lawyer. Hello, my name is Gregory and you are? Pissed off is what I am. What the hell is this anyways? You guys have kidnapped me. This is an abduction. You're being held against my will and I want to leave right now. He clicked his tongue. I have a proposition for you here. Why don't you take a look? I think you'll find the terms are quite generous. I was about to spit in his face, then thought better of it. They had the upper hand currently. My heart hammered faster and faster in my chest as I read the legal form in front of me. I was out of feeling this section of town was rotten. Now I knew for sure. My service area was starting to feel a lot less safe all of a sudden. To whom it may concern, it appears as if you had had a bit of a mishap at one of our fine commercial, residential, or industrial properties. Please find enclosed one coupon for 50% off your choice of chili or soup in a bread bowl from any Sal Soup and Sammy's locations. It's our little way of saying sorry for whatever happened to you. No admission of guilt. Just wanted to do you solid. Your pal, the devil. Owner of Lucy Goose Properties, Inc. I decided to take the coupon and left, saying I wouldn't tell anyone what had happened. It didn't sit right with me, but the man with smoke rising from his shoulders who stood by the doorway without ever having entered the room told me it was a good idea just to sign it. Either that or join the others who were now being made into happy dogs to be sold in the food court. <sighs> I really gotta move out of this town. I hate this neighborhood. Are you ready for more elevator safety tips? All right, here goes. Rule number three, previously rule number two. Really, you're gonna wanna follow all of these so the order doesn't matter much, as you'll find out below. Breaking the third rule can easily be the most deadly mistake you'll ever make. Rule number three, don't step inside the elevator without looking. You might ask, why not? Well, let's just say that the elevator isn't always going to be there when you think it's going to be there. 
Let's say you're looking at your phone, as I was, checking the location of your next service call. You hear those doors slide open, and you don't even glance up as you take a step forward. But as you take that next fateful step inside, you realize that something feels wrong. Why is everything black around the periphery of your phone? Why do you feel dread crawling up your spine? That's why you look before stepping into the elevator. Because if you don't, you'll find yourself like I did, falling down and screaming as you drop down an elevator shaft made of darkness. And down below are not nice things. It is not a comfortable landing zone. It is quite the opposite. I fell down hard towards that deadly pit of metal parts, and the only thing that managed to save me was that I grabbed onto a cable as I was descending. I bit into my hands, and I felt it tear the flesh to pieces as I slowed, but I held firm knowing that I would surely die without some way to slow my descent. Blood began to pour down my arms, and I felt the cable start to grind against the bones of my fingers as I gradually began to slow. The slippery gore didn't help to slow my progress, though, and pretty soon I found myself speeding up, going faster and faster once again, down into the abyss. I forced myself to grip the cable even more tightly and ground my teeth against the agony of the cable rab rubbing against my phalanges. When I finally got to the bottom, I was not ready for it. My feet finally hit the ground, I felt both ankles break. I screamed and wailed in agony, writhing on the cold, hard ground. I called out for anyone to save me. No one came. I waited and waited, calling out over and over again my desperate cries for help absorbed by the thick concrete steel surrounding me. Pretty soon I heard a sound from above and realized it was the elevator door coming down towards me. My heart began to pound faster and faster. I screamed at the top of my lungs. Stop the elevator. There's someone down below. There's someone down below. I heard it coming closer in the darkness. The sound soon right on top of me. A metallic shaking and rattling which took over the world made my teeth tremble in their sockets. I came down on my face and I braced myself for death, shrunk backwards, making myself as small as possible. I felt the flat surface of the bottom of the elevator mashing into my nose and heard the bones inside of it breaking, but then it stopped, just before it completely obliterated my skull. As I howled in pain and terror, I felt shards of bone going down my throat and coughed, gagging on their sharp edges screamed through a mouthful of broken teeth. Someone down there? I heard from just above me. Yes, go up. My nose was being crushed so badly I couldn't even yell. Hang on, let me take my earbuds out. What'd you say, dude? I screamed. Oh, shit. Hang on, man. I'm gonna go get you some help. Away he went, casually walking off by the sounds of it, and leaving me there with the elevator smashed into my face, barely enough oxygen for me to breathe and stay alive for more than a few minutes. I waited in that claustrophobia-inducing darkness and tried to control my breathing. This too will pass, I told myself, over and over again. Only a few minutes, he'll be back. But the metal was crushing my face in the most excruciating way, and there was no possible way to get comfortable. I twisted and writhed, trying to make room. Found none. The air was thick, the darkness total and complete. Pretty soon I began to panic and hyperventilate, as time stretched out forever each second, suddenly feeling like an hour or a day. I had no idea how long I was there for, that I was going to die in that elevator shaft. 
And then I heard someone running towards me from down the hallway. I heard them hit the button to open the door. And they got on the elevator and it began to ascend. Turned out it was another elevator technician from my company who the building manager had called. Hadn't bothered to check on me. They just called it in and left me there. The guy's name was Pete and he had been working in the elevator repair business for over 30 years. He had heard the emergency call and raced over, leaving the job he had been on behind. He pried open the door and pulled me out of there, clapping me on the back and telling me that I was lucky to be alive. I was incapable of speech, sobbed thank you as blood poured from my nose and down out of my down in my throat. Sharp pieces of bone stuck out at odd angles from my broken ankles. He helped me from the building and told me to always remember the rules. I was new and I had no idea what that meant. I was so curious that even through the pain I managed to ask him what rules. Got a lot to learn, kid, he said. Got a whole list of them. Come on, I'll tell you about them on the way to the hospital. Trust me. You're gonna get to know that place real well. After Pete rescued me from being crushed by the elevator, we became close. He eventually started to refer to me as his protege, and I felt like that was an apt word for our semi-professional relationship. Most of the lessons I learned were from him, and they saved my life on more than one occasion. When he was visiting me in the hospital after I broke both my ankles falling down the elevator shaft, he regaled me with tales from his own experiences of elevator repair hell. Back in the 70s, safety regulations were even more lax, so he had quite a few brushes with death. It was my third night in the trauma unit, and I had had one of several surgical procedures earlier that day. They put a series of pins and steel rods in my legs. I had broken my distal tibia and fibula, the doctors told me, and I had ended up with what they referred to as compound fractures, where the bones break completely and stab through the skin. I had four of those fractures, two on each side, it looked pretty gnarly before I finally got fixed up. I had come out of the haze of Anastasia, and Pete decided he would tell me a story to try to cheer me up. His thinking was that it might brighten my day to hear about his own experiences that had been debatably even worse than mine. It did not help. In fact, it just made me have even more intense and terrifying opiate-fueled nightmares. But it was a nice thought. Okay, kid. I'll tell you a good tip to remember while you're out there. If you're ever stuck in an elevator, just stay put. He looked at me and winked, a little grin on his face. That's it, I asked, still droggy from the medication. How come? Is this a good enough reason for you, he asked, lifting up his pant leg to reveal a fake wooden leg. What the hell happened there? Well, back when I was younger, about your age, I got stuck inside a box on an old mental hospital on the weekend. There was nobody around, and the security guards were new, I guess, and didn't know what they were doing, so they just silenced the emergency call button of the elevator, thinking it was malfunctioning. They didn't realize I was stuck inside. I tried calling for help, but nobody answered. I screamed and screamed for several hours, then ended up in there all night, then the next day, and then another night. By Sunday, I was losing my mind. I was thirsty, starving, afraid nobody was going to come for me. So I tried to pry the doors open. I managed to get them open and I saw I was just below the basement. The box had stalled on the way up. And I realized I could pull myself up and then get down on my belly and crawl out of there. 
but I was worried because I knew this was dangerous. If the box decided to move at exactly that moment, I could easily die. It'd be severed right in half. That happens far more often than you could possibly imagine. I decided I needed to take the risk. I'd been stuck in there for so long. I was terrified I would die there. Thinking back, I should have just stayed put, but try telling that to a young man in his 20s who has his whole life ahead of him and thinks he's invincible. I told myself that box wasn't going to move at that exact moment. There was no chance of that, but I was wrong. Just then, as it happened, another guy from my company had been sent over to check the elevator. Well, he got things moving again, just as my midsection was crossing the threshold to the other side. I had only an instant to react, and I did. Pulled out my waist and my right leg as quick as I could, reflexively, since I was terrified of that happening. But my other leg wasn't so lucky as you see here. Holy shit. Holy shit is right. The elevator ceiling came down on it, and it didn't just break it, it pulled me in. I felt myself being sucked down into the elevator as it went down and down, taking me with it. I dug my nails into the linoleum floor and howled in pain until it finally ripped my leg clean off. Pulled it out like a drumstick from a turkey dinner. Clicked his tongue and mimed this. I ended up on the same floor where we're on right now, in a hospital bed that looks a little bit like the one you're sitting in. At least you get to keep your legs. A frowning nurse walked in wearing a set of colorless green scrubs and carrying a small plastic cup full of pills and a needle in her hands. She set these items down on my bedside table wordlessly and pumped some liquid hand sanitizer on her hands from a nearby dispenser. Visiting hours are now over, she said to Pete, her eyes cold and compassionless. Sure, he said, getting up to leave. He gathered his coat, something fell out of his pocket onto the bed. I didn't notice it at first, didn't even realize it had happened until after he left. The nurse gave me my pills and a blood thinner medication that left an irritating bee sting feeling that didn't go away for several hours. Once she was gone, I noticed the object sitting on the bed beside me. A small golden pin with the initials S-U-E-R-M on it. At first I thought it said sperm, and I giggled a little bit. But then I realized I was just still just crazy high from the epidural and my last dose of IV morphine. I read it again, tried to figure out what it meant. I would need to ask Pete about it later, I thought. Then the nurse came back in. Oh, by the way, she said. I forgot. Your family called. Your dog just died. She walked away without another word, and that was the last I saw of her for the rest of the night, despite my terrible pain in the ring call bell for hours on end. I was told the next morning the call bell system had gone out and they'd been doing hourly rounds. I hadn't seen anyone. The rest of the stay in that place wasn't much better. I won't bore you with the details of my hospital acquired infections and the eventual dependence on opioids that resulted from my time there. For my botched surgeries. The city, I'll tell you, even the hospital is a shithole. For the rest of my time in that place, though, I stared at that pin. I couldn't help but wonder what those initials meant. I finally got my walking papers after weeks of physio and OT. It took me a lot longer than that to even begin to feel normal again. I asked Pete about the pin after my discharge, and he reluctantly told me another tip. A society that only meets twice a year. I was astounded at what he told me. I listened and nodded hesitantly when he asked if I was interested in perhaps joining. He described something that I would only later believe to be true once I had seen it with my own eyes. 
the Society of Untainted Elevator Repairmen. The last line of defense between heaven and hell. After Pete told me about the organization Swarm and everything it stood for, I was flabbergasted. He said they were the last line of defense between hell and earth. But what that meant, I had no idea. I would find out later on all about the secret battle between good and evil that was raging between heaven and hell, with earth caught in the middle, the elevators being the only mode of transportation between all three. Not all elevators, of course, only chosen few. Some are one way only. Hellevators, for instance. Those are rides straight to the dark place itself. Then there are the ones that go up, but a rare few can go between all of them. Swerm made sure that none of the boxes were overridden, that no elevators operated without authorization from all three parties involved. We were the representatives of Earth, and kept up the maintenance of the boxes as our end of the bargain, Pete told me. See, once upon a time, it was realized that the big guy upstairs needed to talk to the pointy-haired dude down below once in a while. Don't ask me why, but there's definitely proof of it in the book. Remember Job? Lucifer was up in heaven, just walking around, and walked up to God and said, Hey, God, your pal Job wouldn't like you so much if he burned his house down, killed his family. Now would he? The point is, how do you think the devil got up there? Stairs would have taken forever. He definitely took an elevator. Anyways, the reason I'm telling you all this is that I think one of those elevators that goes between all three realms might actually be in my own apartment building. It's a rickety old thing, I'm assuming, which makes it all the more likely to me. You ever see Indiana Jones and in the Quest for the Holy Grail? Then you'll see what I'm saying. The dirty 1940s era elevator is a perfect disguise for something far more grand and complex. And besides, that would explain what happened the other night. It was about 3.30 in the morning, and I was waiting for the elevator with the laundry basket clutched precariously in my arms. The door rattled open, across the steel track, to reveal a thin man in a white three-piece suit. He had a hat, was where holding a polished walking stick, looked like someone from a different era entirely. He smiled at me with thin lips, and waved me into the box. His eyes looked black, with not a hint of color in them. I noticed as the door closed behind me, a shiver running down my spine. He never broke eye contact, just stared at me as if looking straight through me. I broke into a cold sweat as his grin grew wider. Laundry day, he asked. <laughs> you know it. I tried to pretend everything was okay, knowing that it wasn't. Gotta make a quick stop first. Hope you don't mind. It won't be long. He poked the steel panel below the elevator buttons with his walking stick and it popped open, revealing a sudden secret hidden compartment. Inside, it was an additional button, which said on it, Lowest Level. What the hell? Oh, that's exactly right, young man. I'll pop down to my humble abode, and then you can come back up and do your laundry. On the way down, we can discuss a little business proposition. I looked at him terrified, realizing with dawning apprehension who this man in the crisp white suit really was. You can't be serious. The words fell out of my mouth and I closed it before I could say anything else that might offend this thing. Oh, I am quite serious, in fact. Now, I know you have your oaths and your list of rules with Swarm and all that, but I just want you to consider for a second, just for a second, how good it would feel to have unlimited money. Not only that, but everything that comes along with it. You know chicks dig guys with cash, right? You want a girl? You want a guy? Come on, man, you can't say no to that. 
Even Bill fucking Gates doesn't have unlimited money, for Christ's sake. All you have to do is sign this. He's holding out a very lengthy contract with the tiniest print I'd ever seen in his hand. The fountain pen in the other. It's ink stripping dark crimson red on the floor of the elevator. Sign it. I gulped down nothing but dryness and said no. His anger was immediate. His wrath more than terrifying. You know who you're fucking talking to, shit for brains? I can annihilate you right here and now. Nobody would even know you were gone. I can erase you from the face of the earth so there's no memory of you ever existing at all. Even your parents wouldn't remember you. So let me ask you again. Do you want to sign it? Be my repairman? You know you want to. It's either that or pain. As I shook my head one last time, too numb to speak, I dropped my laundry basket and began to rise up into the air, defying gravity. He held up his hand, made clawing motions downwards, and I felt the skin peel off my face in long, ragged strips. I screamed, and he did it again and again. I howled in pain and twisted away from him with no avail. Will he sign it now? I screamed no. My eyes suddenly, suddenly felt like they were on fire. They began to pour blood. I wanted so badly to scratch them out of my head. My blood felt like it was boiling in my veins. My breath felt like fire with each agonizing inhalation. Each part of my body was suddenly made of pain. My arms and legs, chest and abdomen. Everything was agony. Like it was being seared with a brand that would leave a lifelong scar. Sign it. Never! Ding. Very well, he said as the elevator door opened. It slid to the side to reveal absolute darkness without sound or smell. Maybe next time. He tipped his hat to me and I stepped into the void. He disappeared instantly. I fell down on the floor of the elevator in my dirty clothes, which thankfully broke my fall. My hand went up to my face to feel the damage there and felt the skin was intact. It was all just a vision the bastard had conjured up to fool me. He had left me unscathed, but utterly terrified. I'm going to take the stairs to my apartment for the rest of the time I'm here. I don't care what anybody says. You guys can all take the elevator. I'll walk. Here's another rule that people are constantly breaking. Rule number six. Don't lie about your weight if you want to live. How often have you actually looked and checked the weight capacity sign before hitting those closed door buttons on the elevator? I bet you could count the number of times on one hand, especially if you live in a big city where you're constantly going up and down on elevator rides. And yet every elevator repairman will tell you that is one thing you should always do without fail. The average weight capacity of an elevator is 2,100 to 2,500 pounds. Usually it would take 15 people or more to exceed that limit. Typically no problem, but not always. If you look through the history of elevator accidents, which I have, you'll see that the majority of them occur on construction sites. Sure, a few happen in completed apartment buildings and condos where the cable pulling the passenger elevator simply snaps and the car plunges down the shaft, resulting in the inevitable deaths of everyone inside. What they don't tell you is that the cable doesn't just snap for no reason. They break because people are consistently ignoring the weight limit signs. Over time, those cables begin to buckle and fray, little strands coming loose one by one and breaking until there is nothing left. That happened to a co-worker of mine at Mackenzie Elevator Repair Company. But the story is a little different. In this case, it wasn't even a cable pulling the elevator. It was a motor on a skip hoist. Those things operate a bit differently than typical elevators. Instead of a cable, there are essentially gears being turned by the 
motor drawing the car up and down track on a tower. If you've driven past a high-rise construction site, you've seen them without even realizing what they're called. They just look like giant elevators rising up and down on a big steel tower that's just outside the building. The box itself looks like a subway car which has been cut in half with a gate on one side that lifts up to let people off and on. You have to step over a three inch wide gap to get to the floor of the building you're look working on as well. Looking down at the ground far below as you step across, the car swaying back and forth with the motion of too many people. You don't want to look down. This friend of mine was telling me about a uh, story over lunch one day. I quickly forgot about my turkey sandwich and just sat there listening to him, my jaw agape. His name was Brian and he had worked on high-rise construction projects for years before coming over to our company, touting how much safer it was to work with us. I can't imagine the hell he must have gone through to be able to make that claim. As I've shared here before, ours is a dangerous line of work. Elevator repair is not for the faint of heart. So I was getting on this hoist one day at the start of my shift. Had all my tools and my bag full of gear. My lunch and all that. A bunch of other guys were getting on the lift with me. He was saying between bites of his meatball sub. And this guy comes in at the last second with this pallet full of tiles. The skip hoist operator asks him how much weight you got there. And he says it's 1,200 pounds. But he says that's fine. The lift is rated for 6,000 pounds, so no problem. The door is closed and everything's normal. We start going up and I hear this weird creaking noise. I tried not to worry about it too much since it's a construction site, stuff is always making weird sounds, and nothing is 100% safe. We're getting up there, I don't know which floor, but we'd been moving for a little while and the operator accidentally went a little bit past the floor somebody needed to get out on. I think we were up near level 20 or thereabouts, so he stops the lift and starts to go back down, and suddenly the whole thing drops. I got that feeling. You know the one you get when you're going down the first big drop of a roller coaster ride? Well, it was like that, but a thousand times worse. And that's when we started floating. At least that's what it felt like, just for a second. Like our feet were lifting off the ground and we were suddenly weightless, the whole pallet full of tiles lifting up in the air just a couple of inches. And then we stopped suddenly. We must have dropped about 10 stories. The skip hoist operator started screaming at the guy, asking how much does that thing weigh. It's not 1,200 pounds, that's for sure. He decides he's going to go back down to ground level. So he starts the hoist up again, and it falls down again. Same thing. My heart was already hammering in my chest, but at that moment it was like the whole world just stopped. Suddenly, I was remembering things from my childhood again. You know how they say your life flashes before your eyes? Well, it does. Then we crashed into the ground and it felt like the end of the world. I just remember seeing carnage, absolute carnage, as everyone around me, myself included, broke just about every last bone in our bodies. I remember seeing so much blood. That and the dust that hung around the air, making it impossible to breathe. Made a caked-on paste of brownish-gray dust and clotted blood that covered every inch of that space. I was the only one alive after it fell. Apparently, I landed on enough other people that it cushioned my fall. The other guys in there saved my life without ever realizing it, and I'll have survivor's guilt for the rest of my life. Thinking about their lifeless bodies lying all around me. Teeth and brains splattered on the walls. Intestines hanging from a screwdriver which had somehow driven itself into the wall like a dart. Arms and legs missing their owners laying on top of me and all over. If I had been capable of screaming, I would have. 
but my lung was punctured with a piece of metal debris, making it difficult to breathe, let alone call out for help. They probably thought I was dead, which accounted for the lackluster rescue effort. I waited in that pile of twisted corpses for hours until I eventually heard the sound of voices up above and then crashed through the ground floor into the concrete pit that would eventually be the basement. Apparently the motor had failed because we exceeded the weight capacity. Because of that, my insurance claim was denied. The doctors in the hospital had to sedate me when I got my letter from the company saying they wouldn't be covering my medical bills. Lucy Goose Insurance Co. What a bunch of pricks. My friend exhaled loudly and went back to eating a sandwich. I had suddenly lost my appetite. I think I'm going to have to add a new rule to the list. One about never working on construction sites. Alright gang, let's recap the rules so far. Rule number one, never ride the escalator. Rule number two, don't get off the elevator until the door is open all the way. Rule number three, don't get on without looking. Rule number four, don't try to save yourself. Rule number five, don't ride with the devil. And rule number six, don't lie about your weight if you want to live. Reading through all these now, I'm realizing it's all don't do this and never do that. Well, sorry, I guess I'll try to turn this one on its head. Rule number seven. Ram the elevator doors with your mobility scooter only if you were looking for a painful and terrifying way to commit suicide. Okay, you know what? That's way too wordy. Okay, here goes for real this time. Rule number seven. Don't ram the doors with your mobility scooter, you stupid, stupid idiot. Again, another rule that should go without saying, the operative word being should. But people are intent on doing ridiculous and dangerous things. They think behind those doors lies the elevator, futilely waiting for them. There's nothing else behind those doors except for the inside of that box. That's all there ever was, and all that there will ever be back there. But if you've read these rules, especially number three, you already know that's not the case. Those doors are closed for a reason, so that you don't die falling down a dark pit of despair that may or may not lead directly into hell. But alas, some people like to find these things out the hard way. I was out at a call when I met one such individual. He pulled up next to me at the elevator doors in his rascal, and I gave him a polite little nod which he ignored. I was waiting patiently for the box to come up so that I could leave to go to the next call. The elevator doors hadn't been working properly, but I had just fixed them so they opened and closed smoothly again. This guy looked to be in a hurry. He was tapping his foot and looking at the time on his cell phone and muttering, Come on, you piece of shit, to no one in particular. That was when he decided to take matters into his own hands. He backed up and took a run at the door with the scooter. He crashed into it loudly and dented the door slightly. I was so shocked I couldn't even speak at first. I had heard of such things happening, had even seen security camera footage of it, but I never thought I would witness such crass idiocy in person. Backing up again, he got ready to drive into the door once more. Stop, you're going to kill yourself, I yelled at him. He gave me a look full of contempt and his face went red with anger, then a bruised purple shade. I realized that this guy had more than a few issues. I've lived here for 13 years, and you move in today and think you know better than me? Screw you! And this elevator! He burped loudly. He is a piece of shit. You'll see. You gotta give him a good shot every once in a while. They'll walk all over you. I had no clue what he was talking about, but wasn't about to let him break my legs by getting in his way. He rammed the accelerator again, and... 
went full force into the door. This time it did more than dent it. It crumpled slightly from the impact and reluctantly rattled open, revealing the dark shadows of an empty elevator shaft. The man screamed when he saw what was happening, and then his scooter tipped forward and over the precipice into the darkness. He turned around as he was going over and reached for me to save him. I instinctively grabbed his arm, then quickly realized he was far too big for me to lift. The bastard was probably 400 pounds. I hadn't been to the gym in a while, and even if I had, I didn't think my time watching Netflix while I lazily jogged on the elliptical would have made much difference in this situation. I've used a few other machines infrequently, but weights are just so heavy. The scooter fell away beneath him, and I was suddenly struggling to support his girthy body as he kicked, his sweaty form slipping further and further down through the door and into the darkness. It only took a few seconds before I realized I wasn't going to be able to save him. My feet slipped and skidded across the dank old carpet, and I tried to let go of him to save myself. He sensed this, and his eyes widened with terrified anger. Don't you drop me, you son of a bitch! I'll kill you if you drop me! Don't you dare! His blackened fingernails dug into my arm, leaving the skin tear torn and leaving bloody red marks behind. I have to take a bath in antiseptic gel in the work van after this one, I thought to myself. I made the mistake of looking into his eyes and saw he was panicked and desperate beyond anything I had ever seen before. His grip on my arm tightened and then I suddenly felt myself sliding inch by inch towards the doorway. Oh shit, that's not good. I began to panic right along with him then. By screaming, I beat at his hand, gripping my forearm realizing he was going to drag me down with him. My screams turned to shrill cries of terrified anger as the darkness of the elevator shaft filled my vision. I made the mistake of looking in the man's eyes and saw he appeared to be possessed by something now. He smiled at me with eyes black and soulless. But then again, maybe that was just my imagination. I hadn't been sleeping much. That was when the elevator came up. Thankfully, my arm was still inside the doorway. The car was like a freight train blowing through. It annihilated the man with one swift and crushing movement. Then it rattled to a stop and the doors opened, revealing a couple Boy Scouts with their troop leader. From what I know of the neighborhood, I guess he was either taking them door to door or selling candies for fundraising purposes. Or, more likely, he was bringing them up to his apartment to murder them and make their skins into a sweet drum set. It was definitely one or the other, but I'm not sure which. They, of course, began to scream when they saw the severed hand still clutching my wrist with whitened knuckles, shooting blood from a severed artery that bathed them both in a crimson shower. I shook my wrist free of its grip, then, a, with a concerted effort, forced a smile finally managed to knock the thing loose by whacking it against the elevator door frame. Hey kids, you ever meet a handyman? I asked, shaking the decapitated forearm like a maraca, trying to lighten the mood. They laughed with innocent and uncertain laughter. It's almost Halloween after all. And a reluctant... Reluctantly they went off with the now impatient looking troop leader who dragged them away towards his apartment. I heard the sound of reggae music blasting from that direction a moment later, and hoped that meant they would be okay. It's hard to imagine someone murdering children to the tune of Don't Worry, Be Happy, but then again, you never can tell with these things. I crammed the severed arm down the gap between the elevator and the hallway, mashing it forcefully with a few good stomps from my steel-toed boot. That was when I heard the man up on the roof of the elevator, making a wet gurgling sound that reminded me of a wet vac. Which reminded me I really needed to replace my shop vacuum. I rode down to the ground floor and eventually he must have expired by the time I got down there. Because I couldn't hear him anymore. I should probably tell the superintendent there's a dead body on top of his elevator. 
But man, I'm getting really sick of filling out incident reports. Does anybody have a good lead on a cheap apartment in a different city? I need to get out of this godforsaken town. I prefer something on the ground floor, if possible. This next one's easy to follow, but a lot of people would think it's safe if they didn't know about the rules. Not to mention a lot of fun. Rule number eight. Don't jump in the elevator. I remember doing this one as a kid, jumping up and down to see what it would feel like. If maybe it would make me experience low gravity like an astronaut on the moon. As a little kid, the elevator didn't even notice. The problem is when more people decide to get involved. A call I was responding to a while back was to rescue a group of college students who had been out drinking and decided to jump in the elevator for fun after visiting the pub. They caused the whole thing to break down and ended up stuck inside of it. As I've described before, this can be a very dangerous situation. Especially if someone decides that they want to try and be a hero. If that temptation arises, just remember rule number four and stay right where you are. Or, you're already in trouble. Just make sure you have a working cell phone with you in case the emergency call button doesn't work. Which it often doesn't. At least in my town. So anyways, these kids were stuck in the elevator, and I'm outside the doors telling them to calm down, not to panic. They're screaming and screaming about how there's not enough air, and they're gonna die down there, and why won't I just let them out? And I'm trying to be polite, but they're just so loud. I can only work so fast, sure, I know they've been in there for two days without food or water, and the fan is broken, and two of them have passed out, and one is no longer breathing, but I've called the paramedics, and that's about the extent of my abilities as far as these things go. The door finally budges after a swift kick to the butt of the pry bar with my boot. I manage to get the thing open, and hands pull me inside into the darkness as I scream. The doors rattle shut behind me. Hello? I asked the seemingly empty elevator car. It had sounded like a dozen people in there just a minute before. And then I remembered the accident. When that group of college kids had died in the same elevator shaft ten years before. The cable had snapped. They'd been jumping in the car when that had happened. It hadn't been completely their fault, it took a lot of negligence on the part of the building owner, the tenants, as well as the elevator repairman who serviced it for something so catastrophic to happen. A soft and delicate pair of hands suddenly reached out from nowhere in the darkness and began to caress my neck, and then my chest. The hands probed downwards, teasing and exploring, and another pair of hands was on me and another doing the same thing. Enticing scents invaded my nostrils. Sex pheromone perfume and something else more unpleasant beneath that. A voice whispered in my ear. You like it? Of course you do. Stay with us. I felt my belt being undone and the buttons of my pants and my fly. Part of me had a bad feeling about all of this. But then the other part thought, holy shit, a threesome? A foursome? Uh huh, I said feebly, my knees buckling. Suddenly the lights flickered on and I saw what was surrounding me. From out of the walls emerged decaying hands, rotten and missing large pieces where the flesh had become macerated and fallen off, which reached out and were grabbing at me greedily, hungrily. There were dozens of them, the wrists sloughing off skin which slopped to the floor in oozing puddles. They caressed my skin with their necrotic hands and pulled me this way and that, greedily as I trembled with fear and fought to maintain my sanity. The lights went out again and I screamed. That was when the elevator began to drop and I felt weightless for a moment, sheer terror and utter horror as I imagined the ground racing up towards me. My stomach lurched in that familiar sensation like the first large drop of a roller coaster ride. The phantom hands held me and gripped me tightly holding me down and waiting for me to, jo to die and join them in their never-ending purgatory box. Some people will tell you 
if you're in an elevator when this happens, to jump at the last second before you land to lessen the impact. Don't. This doesn't work. You're pretty much dead meat unless you can flatten yourself out, and even then you should probably just give up and brace for your inevitable death, as I was doing at that moment. Ding! The door opened and the superintendent was standing there, looking down at me. The light from the hallway was bright enough to illuminate the inside of the box and showed there weren't a dozen hands attacking me. I wasn't free-falling and plummeting to my death as the college kids that now haunted the elevator had. Holy shit, am I glad to see you, I said to the super. I came out here to respond to the emergency call about the people trapped in the elevator. I guess they made it out already. Did you get them out of here? He looked a little embarrassed for a second before he spoke. Uh, well, the thing is, that emergency call button hasn't worked for a while. I've been meaning to get around to fixing it. You probably got pranked by those damn phantom college kids again. They've had it out for you elevator guys ever since the accident. Let me guess, pairs of hands getting all sexy at first and then they start to get all creepy all of a sudden? I nodded. Man, sorry about that. I've been there, no shame brother. He thankfully avoided looking down at the tent in my jeans. Let me help you out there. When you're ready, of course. He reached in and held out his hand to pull me out. I hesitated for a second, thinking about Pete's story. I really liked my legs, I didn't want to lose either one of them. I thought about Tommy being cut in half. And so many others. On the other hand, I didn't want to get molested and killed by a bunch of zombie hands in the dark. You've really got to get that emergency call button fixed. I said to him, If you weren't saving my life right now, I'd have to report you. Yeah, I know. Give me until next week, alright? I'll fix it myself, don't worry about it. His hand was still outstretched, waiting for me to take it. Was this actually a decent building manager for once? Had he somehow not been bought off by the Prince of Darkness? Incredible. Eh, yeah, just call Mackenzie Elevator Repair. Tell him a repairman is stuck and needs help ASAP. I'll have to leave you here, are you sure? Those ghost hands are... Well, let's just say they don't take kindly to rejection. Rule number four, I told him. Don't try to be a hero, or else you get your arms and legs chopped off. Now go call for help for me, will ya? I'll be fine. And I was, I think. More or less. Probably. I mean, my hair turned white the instant that door stood shut again after he left, at the sight of the unspeakable horrors that unveiled themselves to me. I was rescued not long after, although it felt like a thousand years to me, by Pete, who once again managed to rescue me from certain death. It wouldn't be the first time, nor would it be the last. So the moral of the story is, don't jump in elevators. It just isn't worth it even if it does make you feel like an astronaut floating in space for just a fraction of a second. I mean, if you jump around a little, it's probably not going to hurt anybody. And you only live once. But don't. Definitely, definitely don't. Just, and also just not all at the same time, okay? Alright. Part 9, rule number 9, is next. I've been reluctant to talk about the secret society I'm a member of. So far, I've mostly shared various tips on elevator safety, providing grisly examples of why we should be more careful around these giant steel animals. But I want to take a minute to talk about a different danger, the imminent destruction of Swarm. Swarm S-U-E-R-M, the Society of Untainted Elevator Repairmen, is the last line of defense between Hell and Earth. No, it's not sperm, that's what I thought at first, too. Sperm, S-P-E-R-M, on the other hand, is the Society of Possessed Elevator Repairmen, 
who shamelessly mock and imitate our acronym for their own evil purposes. Oh, and they also t uh, transport demons from hell to the surface world. I guess I probably should have led with that. Our society and theirs have been at war with each other for ages, long before modern elevators were even invented. The thing people don't realize is that there were a lot of societies smarter than our current one. They existed throughout the ages, built up over centuries, and wiped out by invading hordes, viruses, meteors, and ice ages. Everyone thinks the modern world is the most advanced, the most technologically capable that's ever existed, but we're not. We're definitely not the first people to come up with the idea of a box that gets pulled up and down by chain to get you from the bottom level of something tall to the top of it. We like to think we're that special, but we're not. Ancient Egyptians actually created what we would call electricity thousands of years before Ben Franklin flew his kite, or Thomas Edison patented his stolen inventions. They made using ley lines the power we have today, hidden pathways of energy that crisscross the earth and intersect at places, causing influxes of great force which can be harnessed using the proper technology. But back in those days the ley lines were much stronger. Today they wouldn't even power a clock radio. You'd be better off using potatoes. The Mayans had elevators as well. But of course the Spaniards came along and brought a bunch of smallpox with them and that was that. No more Mayans. And no more elevators. At least not for another few hundred years. The island nation of Atlantis was well known for their lift that extended far into the heavens and down into the depths of hell during a brief period of diplomacy between the three realms. The towering device was constructed with the help of celestial beings as well as certified members of swarm and sperm, but that didn't last long. The huge elevator was destroyed during the ensuing battle after talks between the three sides broke down, destroying the entire country in the process. But I digress. Swarm meetings are held very infrequently, like once a year infrequently. So when they do come up, it's a pretty big deal. The one I went to last year was no exception. It was almost a guarantee that if Swarm is getting together, Sperm is going to be a bunch of dicks and try to fuck up the party. They're intent on disrupting any gatherings we have, which is why we keep them secret, or at least try to. And this year was no exception. We all gathered at the large auditorium, which was located in a nondescript building south of the outskirts of town. Fortunately for me, the meeting was taking place nearby for once. Unfortunately for all of us, my hometown is a hotbed of evil that's been corrupted by forces of darkness. So there were others not far away who were looking to cause trouble. And they managed to follow us despite our careful precautions. Just as we were starting to eat, the giant custom elevator-shaped cake, we heard the window smash and the smoke grenades rolled in. The doors were kicked open and they marched in carrying submachine guns and pistols. Others swung in through the windows hanging on ropes like a SWAT team. Bunch of assholes. Couldn't let us just have one night off. Fortunately, we had taken precautions. Underneath each table was an array of weapons. The thing about possessed repairmen is they have to aim for the head. They're a little like zombies in that sense, so I've been practicing my aim. One of them came at me, his eyes glowing red, a long blade clutched in his hand. I ducked away and got a shot off with my Glock. Managed to catch him in the forehead and a piece of skull shattered spraying gray matter and gore everywhere. I got under the table and hid with a couple of others, trying to formulate a plan. 
There were too many of them at this point. They'd clearly been recruiting. They'd been bringing up lots of support from down below, too. The bastards had broken the recent treaty and were waging all-out war now. Pete was next to me, crouching in the shadows. He had his trusty handgun as well, which had been taped beneath his place at the table. What do you want to do? There's lots of them. He thought about it for a few seconds. High ground? Mm, high ground. The people around us, under the large banquet table, looked at each other confused. They were going to be in for a show. We jumped up out of our positions under the table and moved towards the next one, remaining unseen. There were dozens of red-eyed repairmen all over the auditorium, and up on the stage where the guest of honor was sitting, surrounded by dignitaries, there was bloodbath. All of our leaders were being wiped out one by one, their guards killed mercilessly. The constant deafening sound of gunfire assisted in muffling the noise of our movements, at least. We made our way to the next table, heading up to the stairs that led to the stage. One of the evil bastards finally noticed us and ran towards us, screaming in rage. Don't ask me what he was so angry about, they're the ones always stirring up shit. I raised my gun and put a bullet in his brain, just as he was about to do the same to me. He managed to get a shot off, though. Hit me in my shoulder. Screaming in pain and horror, I looked and saw Pete waving to me from the stairs. The only way was to go forward. I tried to ignore my newfound fear. I saw a machete on the ground. One of the possessed repairmen had dropped and picked it up clumsily with my uninjured arm. At least it was something. One of the stairs of Pete found ourselves face to face with a dozen red-eyed ghouls. They were grinning evilly and watching with malice as we looked at the dead bodies of our friends. Why the fuck do you guys always have to come and crash our party? You can't just get your own keg and your own karaoke machine for once? We want yours. Whatever you have. We want it for ourselves. All of it. Now give. Give your life first. He raised his gun and took a shot at me, barely missing. My heart began to hammer loudly in my ears. The sickening sound of it zinged past flashed through my mind again and again. I ducked behind the nearest wall, my reflexes and adrenaline taking over. They fanned out and Pete tried to get a few shots off as they focused their attention on where they were going. Pete was a dead shot as always. His clip held an extended 33 round cap capacity magazine and every shot hit its mark. What can I say? We train a lot. It's pretty much all we do aside from fixed elevators. My fear began to turn to triumph as I saw them running away, wide-eyed and full of terror. Or a couple of gunslingers, I guess, but I don't like to brag about it. One of them stayed behind, though. A man striding amongst a pile of corpses. His and ours alike. I had no idea how many we had left, but it wasn't many. Our numbers had suddenly dwindled significantly. The man had smoke rising from his shoulders and a pale, gaunt demeanor. His suit was white as fresh snow, with hair like the feathers of a crow. He opened his mouth to speak and I saw his lips and tongue were far too red, like they were inflamed and infected. He was smiling nonetheless. Do you have any cake left? He asked, striding with a whimsical step twirling a little cane. Yeah, sure, help yourself, like you do to everything else. Oh, I will, I will. He walked over to the table and casually picked up a slice, already cut, and placed it on a paper plate, equipped daintily with a napkin and fork tucked underneath the frosting. Eating it, he walked back over to stand below us. We were up on the dais, surrounded by corpses. 
Nicely done, by the way. I really thought they'd kill you all. He chewed a piece of cake with his mouth open, a little smile playing at the corners of his mouth. Have you thought about switching sides? It really is getting pretty pointless right about now. I mean, you realize you're completely fucked, right? Yeah, we'll get back to you on that, Pete said, his face betraying nothing. Yeah, as I thought. Well, if you should change your minds, you have my number. He turned around and walked away, and my blood pressure began to drop slightly. It felt like I was vibrating from head to toe. The terror and full blast of adrenaline I'd been experiencing. It's not every day that you come face to face with the devil himself and love to tell about it. That's twice now for me. I don't think I'll survive if there's a third time. I have a funny feeling there will be. Have you been stuck in an elevator lately? How about someone you know? Is your elevator out of service? Or always on the fritz? Chances are you answered yes to one of the above questions if you deal with lifts on a regular basis. And the problems are getting worse. That's because they're taking us out one by one. All the good ones, anyways. If you've been following along, you'll remember there's two kinds of elevator repairmen. Good and evil. There's always a few somewhere in the middle, I guess, but let's not complicate things. Most of the elevators you see are just that. Nothing abnormal about them. But a few are more than what they appear. If you open a secret compartment hidden in below the buttons, you'll find a few more levels exist below the ones displayed prominently. These don't take you to the basement, no. They take you to somewhere else. Somewhere much, much worse. Pete, my mentor, and I realized we had only one choice. After nearly all of our comrades had been taken out by the possessed elevator repairmen from hell. We realized we had to take the problem on ourselves. We had to go down and talk to the man himself face to face. But we wouldn't be able to do that alone. We would need help. That was where Michael came in. He was a warrior. Had a fair bit of clout down there. Without his help, we wouldn't make it two steps into the Prince of Lies territory. Which meant that we would need to do a recruitment mission first. There was one place that we knew Michael liked to hang out. The rundown coffee shop at the corner of 23rd and 4th Street. They had the best apple fritters in the city. And he was a sucker for those. Especially when they were fresh baked and hot out of the oven. He only showed up late at night. Sometimes not until after 4 a.m. And it wasn't every day. Sometimes only once or twice a year. But it was our only shot. For months we alternated. Pete going one night, me the next. Seasons changed and 2019 turned to 2020. The pandemic came and closed the place down for a while. Allow allowing us to try and catch up on our sleep for a bit. But then it opened back up. We return night after night, usually just one of us, sometimes both, a display of solidarity in our long-running stakeout. Although there was always the possibility that Lucifer would send someone to take us out, we had a feeling he wouldn't. The man upstairs wouldn't take kindly to a complete annihilation of our kind. War was one thing, complete obliteration another. But after all that time, finally, finally, the other day, he arrived. Michael. By chance, it happened to be on a night when we were both there. Pete just getting up to leave for the night to leave me on my own for the rest of the duration. Michael removed his hood as he came in and dead leaves fell from his jacket as he did so, landing on the linoleum tile floor. They crunched beneath his feet as he stepped towards us heading immediately in our direction. 
eyes blue like ice met mine as he approached, with no expression on his face, no surprise or happiness at seeing us. He was tall, with long black hair that fell to his shoulders, matching his stark black trench coat in color and shape. He had a square jaw and a prominent five o'clock shadow. Bags under his eyes indicated both his age and a substantial lack of rest. Hello, Michael, I said. We've been waiting for you. We were hoping to talk to you. I know. I've been busy. He walked over to the register and we followed him. You want an apple fritter? He asked. They're excellent here. No, I'm fine, said Pete. I'll take one. And a fresh cup of coffee, Dolores. We sat in a booth and waited for her to bring our donuts and fresh cups of coffee. It didn't take long, since we were the only customers. She poured the thick, black, steaming liquid into my mug. The stuff was like dynamite, I had come to realize. On top of keeping you awake, it was also a powerful laxative, rivaling a colostomy. My colon always felt squeaky clean after a night waiting there, sipping the stuff. Do you already know what it is you need help with? You always seem to predict what I'm about to say before I say so. Might as well assume that's the case here and not waste my time explaining, right? Correct. Lucifer has opened up several new elevator gateways to the underworld. That is what you've come here to tell me. You wish to travel with me by your side to speak with him, so that you will survive the negotiations and have some kind of leverage. He was right on the money, as usual. So, will you do it? It will require some legwork, but I believe we can make that happen. Legwork on our part? What is it that we'll be doing, exactly? We will have to use the great escalator to go down. That will mean using your key. That thing has been out of commission for years. Who knows if it even still works anymore. It works. The great beast inside it still lives. It is our only contingency. The only way to get down there without them knowing. The apple fritters sat temptingly on the table, still steaming from heat of the oven. Michael grabbed his and began to devour it, then he slowed down, seeming to remind himself to savor it. I waited for mine to cool down slightly. I had eaten way too many of the things recently and was slightly concerned for my next cholesterol check, but they were still too delicious to pass up when they were fresh. You got a deal, Pete said, without asking me. I immediately whipped my head around to look at him, my eyes wide and afraid. And I thought he would say, hell no. Pete, come on man, you know how I feel about escalators. He looked at me with his brows raised as if he knew no such thing. It wasn't just that one incident that I shared with you in rule number one. Never ride the escalator. There were other instances as well that made me want to avoid the damn things altogether. One time in particular comes to mind. Alright, time for a quick story. A few years back I was doing some maintenance work on one of the giant beasts and somebody, I won't name any names, but it was a trainee, decided to turn the power on without clearing it with me first. And while my hands were still inside the mouth of the damn thing, finishing some last minute adjustments. The giant grease-licked steel teeth sucked my hands right in and I screamed. Oh, how I screamed. I watched as it pulled in my fingers, mashing them and biting into them with an incredible weight from the machinery. It finished with my fingers and so started pulling in the meat of my hands, and the knuckles first and then the palms while my fear ratcheted up further and further. All I could picture was the steady advance of my body going to the mouth of the thing. My hands were in almost all the way, then it would be my forearms, and my arms, and the rest of me. My head would be compressed and eaten by the gears until my skull popped and cracked from the pressure of them. My hands were completely crushed and mangled, and I was instinctively pulling away trying to save the rest of my body from being devoured as well. 
I felt my hands tearing free from my wrists, the cartilage ripping and the bones snapping from the incredible weight of the machinery. Screaming for him to turn it off, but the trainee was probably frozen with fear because he waited for a couple seconds before finally hitting the emergency stop button. When they pulled me out of there, my hands were hanging on by two scraps of loose stringy flesh like rubber bands. I could see the pieces of bone white as snow, but mostly just a lot of bright red blood turning darker as it sat around, coagulating. As I looked at the remains of what had once been my hands still caught up in the machinery, my forearms now cut short and spitting blood in methodical bursts, I passed out. I remember thinking, how am I going to live without those? Uh, but thank goodness for the wonders of modern medicine. They reattached my hands, those clever doctors. Don't ask me how they did it, I'm not a surgeon. But I have full use of them again, and most of the time can forget all about it. I get the occasional pins and needles sensations in my fingers and palms, but other than that, they're good as new. I've got some wicked scars to show for it too. Lines that run all the way around my wrists, like bracelets made of scar tissue. So you can see why I was a bit hesitant to go down, and help turn on the biggest escalator ever constructed and jump on for a ride to the underworld. But alas, we do what we have to do. We agreed to the plan and proceeded to the site of the hidden escalator to hell. Pete, Michael, and I were ready for whatever greeted us down there. At least we had backup now. And Michael was not somebody that you wanted to fuck with. Pete pulled out the key he wore on a chain around his neck. There were only a couple of them in the world, and this one had been entrusted to him. The golden key had the initial swarm emblazoned on it, looking shiny like new, despite its ancient age. He lifted the glass dome covering the keyhole and inserted it there, turning it with an effort. Though the key, the trip down would never end. You could walk down the unmoving stairs forever and never leave them. With a deafening bang, the escalator kicked on and roared to life. The steady grinding noise indicated a severe lack of lubrication, but we had no, no time for maintenance work right then. We were on a mission. We stepped on, and I felt a dizzying sense of vertigo as the heights we descended came fully into view. The escalator went on forever. Talking for a while, we tried to pass the time. It took 22 hours to descend to hell, but we were in no hurry was not anxious to get down there. I won't bore you with the details of our nearly day-long escalator ride. We tried to keep busy, but it was difficult and terrifying, especially considering our destination and my past experiences using the mechanized steel staircases. Once we got down to the bottom, we saw that there were two guards waiting for us down there. They had leathery skin, the color of bruises, purple and blue. Their teeth were long and sharp and smiling as we approached. They had long, curled horns atop their heads and wore ornate steel plate armor, black and polished, with decorative embellishments at the edges. Oh, look, Morg! It's the elevator guys! Hey, I thought we killed all you guys. Oh, I know you. Didn't I eat your mom and dad last week? Oh, looks like you pissed off Grank. Better not say anything else. Eh, eh, eh. They were elbowing each other in the ribs, chortling about how they had killed all of our friends and family members. I suppose they answered the question of where my mom and dad had gotten off to. I was hoping they were just busy not answering the phone. Demons are such assholes. Have I mentioned that yet? We're here to discuss terms, Pete said. I was glad he was able to talk, because I was incapable of anything but anger at that moment. For a ceasefire. A truce. Ha. <laughs> You think the boss is in interested in negotiating with humans? Michael stepped out from behind us. He'd been laying low, staying in the shadows, waiting for his opportunity. I wondered if he wanted to overhear how they were actually behaving without his presence. Does he want to speak with me? He asked, stepping into view. His massive steel wings unfurled behind him, glimmering in the reddish reflections of the fire and lava of the underworld. They were the color of white gold, or platinum, perhaps. Is he interested in speaking to Michael, general of the armies above? Fuck. 
Oh man, Michael, didn't see you there, buddy. How you been? Keeping busy these days? Of course you are. Grabbed the demon by the throat and held his seven and a half foot tall weight, lifting higher in the air effortlessly. The orcish looking creature's legs kicked pitifully. The other one spoke up hesitantly, quietly. Sure, you know he always wants to talk to you, Michael. Just just put him down, okay? We'll let you in. It's no big deal. Michael did not let the demon back down. Instead, he threw him into the lake of fire nearby. He screamed as his armor hissed and melted and thrashed until it was completely silent again. Good. Why don't you show us the way to the throne room? How about that? The demon sighed and turned around, leaving his post and leading us through the heavy obsidian doorway. It opened and revealed the depths of hell. Innumerable people, for as far as the eye could see, were being tortured in the most horrifying ways imaginable. People were having their skin flayed from their bodies, their innards exposed like a drawing from a biology textbook. Lacking any flesh at all to cover the inner workings, screaming and writhing in pain on the rocks surrounded by fire and lava. Others were strung from the walls and paled on spikes, hanging awkwardly from stress positions that looked too uncomfortable to bear for even an instant. Their howls and wails of pain were ear-splitting and awful. I saw some people were being fed various foods in vast quantities that made me want to vomit. A huge man was having decadent-looking chocolate cake shoveled into his mouth and his belly was stretched and bloated beyond the laws of science. His mouth was forced open with a mechanical contraption and evil imps were piling in more and more of the sugary stuff by the second while he cried and made pitiful gurgling sounds. The entire ceiling of the place was made with bodies hanging down around in all directions, their lower halves melded into the rocky ceiling above. They wailed and shrieked with pain, begging for us to kill them as we walked by below. There's more than that, too. Things that will haunt me forever. Images that I will spare you from. Those were just the most mundane examples. The depths of pain and suffering experienced in that place is unlike anything this world has ever known. Even its darkest days. And finally, we arrived at the throne room. Ah, brother! It's been too long! Lucifer got up from his chair and walked over to Michael, and I was surprised to see them embrace. They hugged each other like old friends, and Michael even smiled for once. Lucifer, what are you doing, brother? Michael's face changed quickly from a wide grin into a somber look as he seemed to remember suddenly why we were here. Just keeping things interesting, Mike. You can't just go up there and kill all the good elevator repairmen. You know how much humans hate the stairs. Pretty soon civilization is going to collapse again if you keep this up, so just... just stop it, okay? That was it? Seriously? Just, just stop it, okay? That was all he was going to do? You know what? I don't think I will stop. I'm really enjoying myself. And I don't think there's a whole lot you can do about it without Daddy's permission. Isn't that right, Mikey? Suddenly the room grew darker. And Michael's shadow grew longer. He seemed to gain height and extra dimensions not typically perceived by the human eye. And pulling back his coat, he quickly drew his blade. Lucifer stood up as well and pulled a sword from the scabbard fastened to his belt. The blade looked wicked and curved, split in two at the end like a serpent's tongue. They approached each other, swords in hand, and stood face to face. We backed up against the walls, prepared to watch a fight to the death between the ultimate forces of good and evil. Our lives hung in the balance, we realized, as did the life of every man, woman, and child on the planet. This will be my final entry, maybe for just a little while, but maybe forever. 
I'll explain why in a minute. I hope I have given you some useful tips on avoiding death while using elevators. If you choose to ignore my advice, I'll know that I've at least tried to educate you all on how to stay safe. When you're in a hurry, maybe now, you'll wait before getting off too quickly, so as not to be crushed to death by the door slamming shut on you, severing your body in half and causing a shower of blood and viscera to explode on any unfortunate passerby. Maybe now you'll know to take the stairs, if you have that option. Since choosing to take a ride on an escalator is no minor decision. Remember rule number one, and how they can collapse at any moment. Falling backwards when the parts fail, the main chain snaps. Or how you can easily have your fingers sucked into the steel teeth at the bottom. Or an errant toe, perhaps. Avoid flip-flops if you need to ride an escalator. Of course, you have to watch your weight limit while riding elevators. Never jump while you're inside. And for crying out loud, don't crash your door with the mobility scooter. I can go on and on recapping the rules for you. But if you haven't read them, just take a look back for yourself. If you need a reason, just take a quick look on the internet and peruse the multitude of accidents related to elevators and escalators, like I have, and you'll realize you need all the help you can get when dealing with them. But back to the matter at hand. Back to the reason why I won't be posting any more entries here, at least for now. I've been promoted. I'm no longer an elevator repairman. Now I'm something different, something better. The battle between the devil and Michael in the throne room of hell was a sight to see. And I will try to explain it as best as I can. But you'll have to understand, most of it was happening in a multi-dimensional paradox bubble that just really hurt my eyes to keep looking at. So I spent a lot of the fight just staring at the ground and trying not to throw up. It's like being trapped in a room with a strobe light. They both approached each other with long swords in hand. Michael's giant wings unfurled from beneath his black trench coat and glistening like platinum in the reflected light of the fire and lava which surrounded us. Lucifer unfurled his wings as well, obsidian steel, reflecting no light and seeming only to absorb it, letting nothing escape. Michael was the first to attack, thrusting his sword point with incredible speed. The devil responded by spinning away and parrying with an expert move that quickly caught one of Michael's wings and severed cleanly in half. It fell to the floor with a loud clang. Lucifer smiled, seeing the stunned expression on Michael's face. He was clearly the better swordsman, evidenced with just a single exchange. Michael backed away and waited for him to attack next, confused by the counterattack and worried for his own safety. Lowering his sword, Satan walked confidently towards him, then casually began to attack with his offhand, swiftly striking while Michael backed away and attempted with an extreme effort to defend himself. He was no match for his older brother who was a far better fighter. We have to do something, Pete whispered to me. What can we do? They're supernatural beings. We're just humans. They'll kill us if we get anywhere near them. We both had to give it some serious thought. I was wishing we had planned this out better. For some reason, I was expecting everything to work out with Michael's help. And the backup plan had never been discussed. 
Michael suddenly formed a ball of energy with a swift, circular motion of his sword, which enveloped them both while they fought. A white light from within was warming us even from a distance, and seemed to affect Lucifer in a negative way. The fight was suddenly looking more even, as Michael got in several good blows, with his sword managed to sever a piece of Lucifer's wing, which now hung damaged and broken. They were both cut up and bloodied, with the injuries rapidly beginning to mount. The light seemed to heal Michael, while in turn it burnt Lucifer's skin. He smoked and steamed and bubbles began to form across his flesh, revealing muscle and bone as it melted away. He screamed as he attacked in the white light with his sword. The shapes of them were distorted and difficult to look at, like they were in a Picasso painting. Their faces twisted and warped from the distortion of whatever pocket dimension they were fighting in. Maybe we won't even need to do anything at all, I said. Looks like he might have him handled. Form suddenly sprung from the shadows around us while Michael was distracted. The demons were dark as black holes, and their teeth were the only things visible. White and long, sharp and pointed, dripping venom the color of snot. <laughs> One creature spoke, licking its lips with a long, Y-shaped tongue. We've got you both now, elevator repairmen. You're gonna stay down here for a meddling. The other creature nodded its head in agreement with whatever it was the other thing had said, and they began to drag us away, their black claws digging into our flesh and causing blood to flow. I tried to scream for assistance from Michael, but my mouth was quickly covered, and I saw he was too wrapped up in his fight to see what was happening. We were being dragged out of the throne room, away from our only friend in hell who could save us. My heart was racing and I could feel it pumping in my temple and in my ears. The fear was impossible to describe at that moment. I had just seen the depths of hell for myself, and they were far more terrible and terrifying than anything I could have imagined. The nameless faces everywhere being tortured and held captive for all eternity. I remember a metaphor I heard once. Imagine a mountain made of granite the size of Mount Everest. Every thousand years, a bird comes by and lands on the peak of the mountain. The bird sharpens its beak and flies away. Then it returns a thousand years later and does the same thing. It repeats the cycle over and over again every thousand years. Eventually, over time, incalculable and unimaginable to man, that mountain is ground down to a single grain of sand. And that, my friends, is the first day of eternity. I couldn't help but think about that little metaphor as we were being dragged away from our only chance of escape. The guy currently fighting the devil to death. The idea of spending that amount of time stuck down here was terrifying to say the least. And I doubted that even Michael could find us. Our struggling only made our captors more aggressive, and we made no progress in our attempts to escape. They were dragging us towards another doorway. This one massive and made of ebony wood, decorated with the skulls of hundreds of nameless victims. They opened the doors, and from within I could hear the tormented wails of masses of people. Blood-curdling screams it sent a shiver down my spine and made me feel faint with fear. We have a special place down here for humans, the creature holding me whispered, pushing me roughly inside, into the darkness which contained no light or warmth. And I became immediately colder, like stepping out of the sun on a cold day, on a chilly day, and into the shadows of a building where the sun had not yet ventured that morning, only amplified by infinity. They dragged us down the tunnel, and I began to shiver and scream, and the doors rattled shut behind us. Michael would not find us down there, I realized. He would have no idea where we were. The lack of light in this place was disorienting and dizzying. 
The screams seem to be from all around us now. We're ear-piercing and terrible. My fingers began to feel numb. My nose felt like it would fall off from the cold. And we were left there. Shoved roughly into a crowd and absorbed into it, I was suddenly surrounded by bodies. Tightly packed and weeping, screaming and shaking, terrified and panicked. Someone grabbed me by the shoulders and began to shake me, screaming at me to let them out. To help them, to warm them. I felt like I couldn't breathe. Surrounded by so many cold people, packed together, and they pressed against me and slammed into me as the people shoved and jostled for space. The forms pushing against me should have felt warm and alive, but instead they felt cold as blocks of ice, only freezing me further. How long we were down there, I'm not sure, but I remember feeling a warm hand squeeze mine, and I squeezed it back. It pulled me from the crowd, and it began to get quieter behind me. The doors before me opened, and the lights of hell were a surprisingly pleasant sight to see. Any light was better than that unforgiving, freezing darkness, and the warmth was inviting like a fireplace in the winter. Michael was beat up, bleeding from a thousand cuts great and small. His wings hung tattered and torn to shreds, looking like platinum, a little less now and more like half-plucked chicken. Thank you, he said panting. I hugged him fiercely, my teeth still chattering, my entire body shaking from the cold we'd escaped. You saved us. I can't tell you how f f afraid I was down there that you were net... N -n Never coming back. Pete was beside me, shivering with full body tremors as well. His face a white mask of horror. His eyes darting around with a look I'd never seen before, but would realize later is shell shock, PTSD. Whatever you want to call it, I have it now too. Is he dead? I asked. No. He can't be killed. But he agreed to leave you alone, at least for now. You have what you wanted. A new ceasefire. A temporary treaty. He smiled and playfully waved the decapitated arm of Lucifer, shaking it like a maraca. An armistice? He tossed the arm of the king of the underworld into the lake of fire, and we could hear a scream of pain from the throne room nearby, as if Lucifer had felt it being destroyed. The three of us laughed at that, despite our recent brush with eternal suffering, and began to walk through the cavernous room back towards the great escalator. A few demons tried to stop us along the way, but they were no match for Michael who quickly dispatched crowds of attackers with an effortless energy wave, causing their bodies to disintegrate, the flaking pieces drifting off and floating away like ashes in the wind. The forms above us will haunt me forever. The countless bodies which were driven through the rock ceiling above, flailing and kicking, screaming and writhing like living, tortured stalactites. Much of hell is far worse than the things I've described, but there's no reason to cause you to experience nightmarish for the rest of your existence by describing them to you. The suffering there was unimaginable, incalculable. When we got to the entrance, the two guards were nowhere to be found. I wondered where they could have gone if they had planned on an ambush somewhere further up ahead. The escalator was turned off, and we approached it cautiously. Pete pulled out his key and inserted it in the slot, turning it into the up position. The thing roared to life once again, and the stairs began to roll upwards towards Earth and home. The three of us stepped on wordlessly as it began to ascend. We were only about 20 feet up when we heard the sounds of feet hurrying on a stone floor behind us. We looked over our shoulders and saw innumerable forms emerging from the doorway from hell. 
They were following us, hiding in the shadows and waiting for us to use our one sacred key to turn on the escalator. The sneaky bastards were going to ride up to Earth and invade. We had to stop them. We were the only line of defense at this point. They began to ramp up the steel staircase, gaining on us. I yelled at Pete to run. I screamed and pushed him ahead of me. We scrambled up the moving staircase and tried to outpace the demons who pursued us. The smell of sulfur wafted up to us from below. The group of them had impressive B.O. Ugh, that stink. I was huffing and puffing, but saw that Pete was really struggling. Go ahead of me, kid. I'll catch up. He wheezed, breathing heavily. He handed me the key to the escalator. Take this. Michael was up ahead, slowing his pace to match ours, ready to defend us if the need arose. But there were too many of them, even for him. All the forces of hell seemed to be pursuing us. They had not attempted to halt or escape from the underworld, I realized, only to gain this opportunity for invasion. My fear overcame me as I heard them close behind me. I went past Pete, thinking he had it in, them, in him still to make it to the top. I ran as quickly as I could, my cowardice only obvious with the clarity of hindsight. And as I ran ahead of him, swiftly picking up speed nearing the top, I heard him scream. I looked back and saw he had been overtaken by them. The creatures from hell swarmed over him like locusts, devouring without stopping. His cries for help almost stopped me in my tracks, but my fear spurred me on and I hurried along even faster. I didn't have time to mourn for my friend, my mentor. His death was lost quickly in the enormity of our dilemma. I felt the weight of the key in my hand and ran as quickly as I could, trying not to trip on the constantly moving staircase, trying not to think about what would happen to me if I fell, or if the chain snapped and this escalator suddenly started to fall backwards at terminal velocity, crashing down an infinite distance to the underworld, where we would be trapped without a chance of escape. Up ahead, I saw the top of the escalator and Michael waiting for me there. Toss me the key, he yelled. Without thinking, I threw it at him and dove over the precipice and into our reality. Michael turned the key quickly and in an instant, the horde beneath us was swallowed up into darkness. With the escalator turned off, they were trapped forever in the limbo between hell and earth. Or until someone turned the key again. He handed me back the key with a reverent look on his face. See that no one uses that. Ever. My thoughts exactly, Michael. My thoughts exactly. Something occurred to me then. A worried notion. What about Pete? What will happen to him? Is he stuck in there with them now? Forever? Michael looked at me, his face impossible to read. Those questions are way above my pay grade, kid. Ask the big man upstairs one day when you get the chance. Maybe he'll be able to tell you. I get the feeling Pete'll be alright, though. It sounded like he died before we could turn the escalator off, which means the normal rules would have applied after his death. Let's hope so, anyways. Well, if you find out, let me know, okay? You got it. He turned and began to walk away, but I hung around for a minute. He stopped and looked back at me from a little distance away. Hey, do you want a job? You seem like you can handle yourself under pressure. We need more humans like that. It wouldn't be easy work, mind you. What's the job description? He paused and thought about it briefly. Well, there's a lot of folks up here from below. Now that there's all these elevators that aren't supposed to be around, going down to hell, we need help tracking these folks down, 
getting rid of them before they do too much damage. The elevators, we've shut them down mostly already, but those who are already up here, well, we have to bring them up one by one and send them back down to hell where they belong. Are you up for the challenge? Sounds dangerous. It is. And it will be. But we'll provide protection. You'll be mostly safe if you follow our instructions and let us train you. And you'll have a partner. So let me get this straight. You want me to quit elevator repair and become a demon hunter? Correct. Yeah, that's just about the most badass thing I've ever heard. I'm in. Sounds like a trip. Alright, follow me. He started to walk again, leaving me behind. Hang on a second. I'll catch up. I called ahead to him. I took out my trusty notepad and a pencil hastily scrawled a note, which I hung on the escalator panel where the key would normally go, but where it would never go again. Not as long as I was alive to defend it. As I walked away, rushing to catch up with Michael, I looked back at it and smiled the message I had left there. The memorial. Escalator out of service. Pete.